It's time once again to slip into your camo, grab your bow, and join us out in the field for another episode of the Up North Journal, presented by PSE Archery. The Up North Journal crew is knocked and ready to rock for another exciting adventure. So let's step outside and hit the trail. This episode of the Up North Journal podcast is brought to you by PSE Archery, Spot Shooters Archery, Easy Cut, Packer Max, Hunter's Blend Coffee, Scent Lock, Scent Blocker, Limb Walker Game Calls, Buck Bates, Gut Check, Stanislavski Release Aids, Copper John, Fourth Arrow Camera Arms, Wind Sense Vapor Hunting Products, and Rebel 6 Rubs. And don't forget, you can catch us in syndication at 2 p.m. Eastern Time on goodtalkradio.com. Welcome back to another episode of the Upmerch Journal. I'm host Mike Adams on a sunny Sunday afternoon sitting in the cabin when we should be outside, but we got important things to talk about, right, Dan? Absolutely. There's nothing better than sitting in the cabin, um, actually, on a sunny day, which is kind of odd because we haven't seen sun in I don't know how long. One day this year, they said, one full day of sunshine. Is that what it is? For, for our area here in Michigan, yes. <laughs> So the day would be the second day. Okay, on February 2nd. They said some places in Michigan haven't seen the sun all year. Really? Seriously, yeah. Oh, jeez. Welcome to Michigan. Talk about, uh, uh, what do they call that? Uh, oh, yeah, the winter. Deprivation. Yes. But, you know what? Since you're here with us in the cabin, how about you go out and support some of our supporters? Absolutely. You know what? You can start by going over to Hunter's Blend Coffee as we are drinking ours in the cabin today. Uh, you go over to Hunter's Blend Coffee, and upon checkout... Um, using the promo code capital U N J, you will receive ten percent off your right there. You can yep, see it. exactly. You will receive ten percent off your order when you check out. But that's not all. Who else we got, Dan? We got Bucks Bates. Buck Bates. And you know what? You go over there. You check out their line. They've got their cover scents. They've got a lineup of other stuff on their uh, always always adding. Uh, so I got a feeling we're going to be talking about them a little more tonight. I think so too. And you know what? Uh, you go over to Buck Bates and you check out there for twenty percent off when you check out. Use the code Up North Journal. That'll get you twenty percent. There you go. And our friends over at Rebel Six Rubs. You know what? A beautiful day like today it would be great to be grilling. It would be. Yep. And you can go over to Rebel Six Rubs. And over there is if you use the promo code North Journal. You can get 20, uh, 20% off your checkout there. And if you go over there, use those promo codes. That helps us tell our supporters that, yes, our supporters help us by supporting you. If the good people haven't went over to Rebel 6 yet, they're cooking their food today for the big game without Rebel 6. How sad is that? Very. So, But you know what? Enough of that. Let's, let's get into the show. What do you think? I think we need to get into the show because it's going to be an interesting talk because uh, we're talking elk. We are talking elk. We're to talking start. to start with. Yes, we have got Jennifer Drake, a fellow pro staffer from Buck Bates, the, from Drake's Guiding Services up in northern Michigan. How you doing, Jen? Snowing. It's snowing. Really? Well, it is melting fast and furious here, so I like it. Well, we want to talk a little bit about elk tonight. Um, as a lot of the our listeners know, I, I got a chance to go on an elk hunt and. I wasn't successful, but somebody who was, was your hunting client. And actually, we met up, uh, I think it was the third or fourth day into the hunt, and you actually gave me some tips. And that's kind of what we want to talk about tonight, you know, uh, you know, the guiding part of it, the, the elk part of it, you know, up where we're, we were hunting at, uh, the difference between fall hunting and, and the winter hunt in December. I mean, it's there, there's just, a, there's a lot going on there, I guess. So, uh, I guess. Uh, first of all, I'd like to know, it's, how did you get into guiding? To get, to get all this started and everything, whether it be elk and whatever else you guide for up there, how does that happen? After I got injured and the horse fell on me, I couldn't do a lot of the work required at the ranch anymore. And my friends were talking to me and they told me that I should just hunt for a living. And I laughed and I said, well, you, you know, that's it's not just that easy. <laughs> And they said, but you take everybody hunting, so why don't you get paid to take people hunting? And I said, well, I don't know. You know, I've never really thought about it. And I got talking to the DNR about it, and I found out that you could do it on private land um, without a license, but to do it on state land, you had to be licensed. So I went ahead and applied and ended up becoming Michigan's first female guide. Awesome. Congratulations. Thank you. And, um, And I... Started guiding out for deer, elk, coyote, bobcat, um, bear, and turkey. And um, 
I really got into that a lot. I, you know, I didn't, ha I didn't have a ton of clients right to get go. Um, and I still don't, I don't really take on a lot. So if you're getting in with me, you got to get in fast because I only book so many hunts. Um, I'm a very big conservationist. I really believe in hunting for a reason, you know, to help promote the animals in that area and best help them to have the best habitat possible. So um, I'm really strict about how many hunts I'll put on in certain areas and and what I'll hunt in those areas. So it just makes it a little bit more fun that way. And I can kind of be educational while I'm taking people out. And um, I don't know, it, it ended up just leading into a career of it. And now that's what I do. That's all I do. Well, so. well, it just shows you being the conservationist that, that you are, you're, you're showing that you've got respect for what you do, because you just don't try to pile in as many as you can and, and try to, to grab as much as you can and just kind of overload it for the the months that you do guide you know you you, you take your time and say hold on let's do this in an ethical way responsible and, and responsible about it not just yep. you know being because what what happens i'm assuming is if something were to go wrong you'd be in a pickle with all the other people mm -hmm. you know yes. that you got that you've got lined up and it's like uh oh yep yep that's exactly it and you and you don't want to put up situations like that so you want to have you want to have a good fun time and you want everything to go just right and smooth and you got to stay in good with the DNR and you got to work with them well. And, you know, if you're breaking laws and not in abiding the laws, then, you know, it makes it a lot harder to have a good relationship with them and be able to, you know, help them out and have them help you out when necessary. So, you, you know what, and that's part two of, of, of being responsible is you're working well with the DNR and that gives you uh, a good repertoire with them that whoever you're guiding for you can bank on that and say hey look the dnr like me credibility and, and credibility exactly yep. and that, that's awesome that that's just you know when you when you hear about some outfitters uh unfortunately you hear about the bad ones too yeah absolutely yes you do and there is the slim few that do you know make it harder for those of us that follow the rules you know what i mean and unfortunately, you run into that a lot on if it's whether they're feeding when they shouldn't be or they're, you know, hunting when they shouldn't be or doing hunting without tags or, you know, or not tagging animals. There's all kinds of different situations that arise that are just, you know, really unethical. And all it does is ruin it for the good guys. You know, they're pulling animals away if they're baiting. They're pulling animals away from those that are hunting around them that, you know, now they're not going to see those animals because they get on a pretty good routine of knowing when that food's going to be there. So it's depriving them of a, a successful hunt when you're doing things like that. And that's really unfair and not right to do. So, and the same with when you're tagging or not tagging animals, rather, when they should be, you know, then you're taking away animals that could have been for somebody else that wanted to do it the right way. Well, yeah, before the show started, you know, we, you and I were talking earlier. Uh, we actually, you told me something I didn't know. And, I mean, every year we have new game laws or people or the NRC and DNR want to, you know, test the waters and see what people think about them. And, and you had told me that... They're contemplating right now about implementing new laws uh, for guides here in Michigan, which I didn't know. Can you yeah. talk about that a little bit? Um, well, from what I understand is they're looking to make it um, a little bit more regulated and have a little bit more rules for us and changing some of the rules, um, rewording them, so to speak. Um, and also incorporating that they want us to have an, a kind of insurance Mm -hmm. And like a, at a certain rate is what they want it to be. So, I mean, it kind of, if it does go through and, you know, I understand some of it, but it is going to ruin it for the little guys like me because we're not going to be able to afford a half a million dollar insurance policy for like a year of insurance when, you know, we don't make enough money with enough hunts for that. You know what I mean? So it just takes away from us and uh, and they're doing that and implementing those rules because of all of these people that are guiding and not following the rules mm. um and they they just want to regulate things a little bit more 
to be more cautious so we're not having things like these elk being violated and you, you know baiting unnecessarily or illegally you know um like over baiting or whatever and or baiting in general at all right now because it's illegal even if that does lift for next year yeah the thing that gets me about it is i i, the, I worry about it being a slippery slope if, if they do put these laws in place well guides are first what's next the hunters and right. are we going are we going to make hunters have have insurance policies to go out on state land or even on somebody else's private land i mean it's just it's a real slippery slope to start sliding down and exactly and if you have liability papers drawn up and go and get a you know get yourself a lawyer have a lawyer draw them up the right way that's what i did and you have it all written out right in there that you know they understand the inherent risk of hunting with you know a large game animal or a predator animal and the you know they know the risks of going into state land and they accept those risks and it, it, you know it's not necessary to have insurance then what I, what I don't what situations what what I kind of intrigues me about what you're describing is uh, I'd like to hear their explanation as to why you would need insurance for whatever reason they would give you but yet if I go up north and go on my own hunting. That's what I'm what, saying. What, what, wait a second. I, I, where's it's my so, insurance policy? It's a I, I got to take the chance myself. Uh-huh. Also, right. part two of that, Jennifer, is uh, you're right about the little guy. And I'd really like to know who's kind of behind that, that specific one. Because if it's somebody, it's all about money. Insurance industry, maybe? Well, that's what I'm thinking. Right. And I and I don't want to get on that soapbox because that'll just right because you never know. But I'll take right. up the whole show. It'll exactly. So I'm kind of it, it's one of those things. Ask questions, mm-hmm. and I get a feeling if you go and look at it, it'll be a, it's a money grab. Absolutely, and, and and it'll put you the little guy out of business. But yep. that doesn't mean the big guy that can afford it is. Is good either, right? They can be just as bad as anybody, right? Absolutely, and we've seen that here in Michigan. No names mentioned, but we've seen that. So, right. um, yeah, I want, I want to before we go to our first break. I, I want to kind of turn the corner here just a little bit. I, I want to sh- throw the picture up of your uh, your ah. hunter this year when I was up doing the December hunt that uh, your hunter took this big bull elk. Um, yes. How, how did that all go down? I mean, that had to be exciting for you as just as a guide. It was very exciting. Hold on just a second. Sure. My dogs are barking. Just a moment. That's okay. But uh, but Danny, this is this right here is the the bull elk. That, this was the gentleman that you were you were with. I I, I got to tag along. Yeah, you were with. Yeah, in the hunt. Yep. That was the day after I left, or two days after I left. Two days right? after you left. Yeah. So, yeah. Exactly. So this this all went down, Jennifer. You, you took this guy in. It took you four days to to get on uh, to a nice bull and him to be able to take it. Uh, you know, as a guide, what what's it like when one of your customers take a, a bull like this? Oh, it's amazing. I live vicariously through my hunters. I honestly, absolutely love watching their success and having them be successful. And, um, you know, it's really important to me to try to capture those moments for them and get a lot of pictures of that and and try to make it the best experience I can for them. Because, like, with a bull, it's a -a once-in-a-lifetime hunt here in Michigan, and it is not like hunting out west. So it's a whole different experience, and it's so much more fun and um, just a, a unique good time you're you're in northern michigan and whether it's the early season hunt or the late season hunt it's it's a lot of fun you know they present their own different challenges each season so you know it it can go one way or another really easy you can either be successful or you you won't be depending on where the herd is and how well you know the herd and how familiar you are with the area that's why it's important to get a guide and to like trust your guide So, um, sometimes with like hunters, you'll run into them and they've hunted out West and they've taken elk out West many, many times. And, and they just think that that's how it's supposed to go, you know? And when you get here in Michigan, it's a whole different ball game. They're not the same creatures as the elk out West. Sure. They look similar and they're in all those aspects, but in their activities and their habits and even their patterns, it's completely different. It's a different setup. There's a lot more pressure here. They're a lot more leery. Um, they will move off a lot faster. Um, so, like with this bull hunt that we did this this late season this year, um, mm-hmm. we went in. We were having a hard time in a different area. We had seen some animals, but we um, hadn't been able to make a successful kill. 
So we moved to another area where I have patterned these this particular herd very, very well for many years. And I've followed them around. I know their exact routine. I know what they do. Um, I had known that there was a couple other hunters going to be there in those first couple of days. So I didn't want to go in there and step on anybody's toes or ruin their hunt, knowing that they would be in there. So I had chose to take them to a different area for the first few days. Okay. Um, so now after they had successfully taken their tags, um, and they did a great job, one was a bull and one was a cow, um, we came in and they had taken a, a nice, uh, I believe it was a six by six bull. Um, it was a little smaller than the one that we ended up taking, but they hadn't seen the one that we ended that we got. They, he must have been on the back side of the hill or something, because they shot him in the same field, general vicinity where we were going, mm-hmm. um, which I had expressed. You know, we had all seen it working at that ranch that that's where they're at. You know, so. We we went in there, and um, it was nice and early, and you got to accompany us. We um, we got there, and um, I believe, you know, some stuff happened, and you had to take off. And... Yeah, I forgot my license. <laughs> Go <laughs> yeah. ahead and say it. <laughs> I, I, I was, I was being, being dumb that morning, not checking things. Go ahead. <laughs> it, it happens. I don't want to give you a hard time about Give them a hard time. Oh. Go ahead. It's a learning lesson for everybody. Check your check your back. And luckily, I checked mine before I went out, but I was at the parking area when I did it. <laughs> See, and that's one of the first things that I always ask is, do you got your tags with you? Do you got all your stuff? And then, you know, do you want to put it in my bag for the hike out? So we make sure it's with us, you know, no matter what. We don't want to forget mm-hmm. nothing in the truck. So um, so this fella, we when we got there, after all of that... Mm-hmm. <laughs> We had gotten out there. I hiked out, and um, while you guys kind of sat back and visited before everything had went down, and that was kind of when everything went down and you Mm -hmm. figured out you missed your tag, Um, I went down there, and I could see the herd. And they were bedded down. Some of them had already gotten up and were moving out of the field, and the bulls were all bedded down on the backside of a hill. And I knew that they were going to get up before long, so I knew I had to get back on Hustle. Mm -hmm. And it was a pretty crunchy morning, so I was a little concerned about the snow and stuff. But, you know, I figured if we got in there quick enough, we would be able to get a shot as soon as opening hours. So I went back and I got everybody together. And we started walking down. um, And you had to leave, and you were going to come back and try to get out there with us. So... We snuck our way down there and managed to sneak up on the backside of a little bit of a hill and um, kind of hide ourselves from them a little and be peeking over the top of it to watch them. Mm-hmm. And when they finally started getting up, then um, we got to pick which bull we wanted as they started to file down because I knew that they were going to come down the field and move this certain pattern that they always do. All right, Jennifer. So so as you're, as you're all peeking over, over this hills and everything and getting ready, uh, there's... there's your hunter needed to make a decision on which one he was going to shoot. So how about after we come back from the break, we kind of ask that question of how he decided which one to shoot. Okay. All right, we're going to step outside. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back after this. PSE Archery has reinvented the way you buy bows. From now on, you can make the most educated decision possible by basing your bow choice specifically on your shooting needs and goals. All you need to do is ask yourself, what kind of shooter am I? What do I want to achieve? PSE will help find the right category for you. So, what kind of shooter are you? Find out at PSEArchery.com. Welcome back, everybody. Second segment of the show. We're talking elk hunting. We are, we are peeking over hills, crunching through crunchy snow. The guide is leading the charge. And your hunter, who had a bull tag, uh, how many bulls were you looking at in this bunch? There was 25. Um, of those 25, there was um, probably about a dozen, maybe a half dozen that were mature, decent bulls. Um, on, of those, there was two really nice ones. So, so did okay. So, the the gentleman said, "You're my out." Did you have that, this discussion as to what he was looking for in in the bull that he wanted to take? Uh, was he good with any bull? Uh, 
It'll we work. we had talked about that prior to even ever hunting on the first day um because that's something i really like to find out right off the bat because i um i do think trophy hunting is okay and everything but i'm a more of a conservational hunter so i look at for mature um an aged bull that maybe he's no longer breeding if i can find one um or something with an oddball rack that maybe you want to get those genetics out of the herd and, you know, help that herd have a more stronger genetic line. Um, just different things like that. And, uh, so I talked to him first and I asked him, uh, you know, I asked what his preference was because I leave it up to the hunter. You know, it is their choice. If they, if they want a, a big one, we do our best to find them the biggest one we can. And, um, and then he has the option to say, yeah, I'll take this one or no, no, I'm not quite happy with this one. So, um, we got on the herd and I told him, you know, I knew what bulls were in here. And, um, I knew that the fella that had gotten the bull two days prior on the first day, I think it was the first or maybe it was the second day. Cause we were there on the fourth. Um, he had taken a nice one, but it was not the big one. And I knew that. So I got, you know, him ready for that. And I expressed that, you know, this was, this was what we could see and he could be in this group or he might be up with the cows. It kind of depends. And the cows were already kind of moving a little bit further along. So we were going to have to try to cut them off and go to a different area, which we had tried to do that the day before because we missed them just like that. So, uh, we, we got in there, we got set up. We, we knew we had those, that particular group of bulls at this stage, he had said, well, if the big ones already left with the cows, I'm going to take one of these. Okay. So, okay. So yeah. he was, he had, he had choices when you gave him the options. Yeah. Yep. Well, you got so, to like choices. Right. Yeah. And, and he liked having choices too. And as they were filing down off the hill, I, I told him, I said, you know, those are the three nice ones right there. I said, if you wait for them, they're going to come last. And all the young ones started filing out and, um, the big ones did, they were, they were the last ones and, um, they were kind of all grouped up for a while and we had to wait until the, the younger ones wanted to follow the cows cause they don't like to be left behind, you know? And so they started heading towards the cows to get with the main herd, but they're not allowed to be in with the herd. You know, they always have to lag back a little and you know, they're slowly single filing it that way. And, uh, it, as the herd, you know, that cluster of bulls broke up, then that big one got to be off to the side by himself. And I said, now that's the big fellow right there. I said, he's got a nice wide rack. I said, that'd be the one to take. I said, you need to get yourself lined up. And he said, well, how far do you think that is? And I said, well, I said, you're looking at 370 yards right now. And I said, and you're, you know, that's a long shot. And I said, are you, are you capable of that? And he was sighted in dead at 250. So, um, and he was hitting in, um, he said the size of a 50 cent piece. Okay. Consecutively. So he was doing good at that, you know, so he, he seemed like he was real positive in himself and everything at the time. Um, so I let, you know, I told him, you know, whenever you're ready, take a nice deep breath and, you know, gently squeeze the trigger, don't pull and let's do this. I said, aim for center mass. That's where we want to go. I said, we're not, we're not going for anything else at this distance. It's going to be too hard of a shot. Just aim for center. So he, you know, and above his back at that distance, obviously. So you're, you know, compensating for range and all of that anyways. And, and it, he hit him in the first shot. Um, he went a little ways. He uh, laid down and then got back up and he shot him again. And in total, he ended up taking four shots um, because we were trying to make sure that, you know, it, he wasn't just wounded and going to suffer or go someplace and be hard to find or, or anything like that. We wanted to make sure that it ended for him right there. And there was no other bulls in, you know, in the way. They had all moved off to the side and were watching from the side. So we were able to, you know, get a couple more shots in and he, and he was able to get him again. And, um, on the final shot, I knew it was good. It was a liver shot. His back leg stretched out. Um, that's a good indicator of a nice liver shot. And we let him wander off. Um, I believe that you had walked up as he shot the first shot. I'm not really sure that you were um, at the gate somewhere in there. I stood back and watched it all unfold. I was about four or 500 yards from where you, you were all at. I walked up. After he took the last shot, I watched him walk off actually, yeah. uh, in, into to that secondary, uh, opening. And that's when you had went out to check out where you had the first shot at that point. Yeah. Yep. 
So. And I, I found blood right on the first, where we first shot him. I knew that then that we had gotten him and that he was going to die when I found that first bit of blood. And I, and I followed his tracks over to the next spot and I was looking around there. And um, to be honest, actually, then I started to question myself because I was like, oh no. And I didn't see any more blood where he had shot him the second time when his legs had drawn back like that. And I was like, oh, oh, this isn't a good sign. And then, and because there, and, and this is why I was confused. There was the other two kill sites there. Okay. So there was a lot of blood in the snow. Okay. Gotcha. And so it was hard to tell the difference between what was fresh blood and what was frozen mm-hmm. looking fresh blood. <laughs> right, right. So, um, so I was struggling a little bit with that, just kind of following, trying to figure out where his tracks, because with 25 bulls and all of that mingling around, because when he, after the first shot, he had mingled in with the herd again for a second. And then the herd had separated from him again. And he had, that's when he had laid down and then got back up. And so there was a lot of tracks all over in that area that had crisscrossed. And so I, you know, I had to be sure that I was on the right one without a blood trail. Um, what I did end up finding was I saw he started urinating Mm -hmm. and when they start urinating like that, and it's pretty much just free flowing out of them while they're walking, you know, you, you know, you got them in the liver. Um, and, and it's a pretty good indicator that if you just give it some time, they're going to pass. So we decided to wait for a while and give it a little bit of time. And we gave it about 45 minutes, an hour, and um, just kind of started following that urine trail a little bit. And um, actually, um, as we crossed in to where there was like a little ditch line, you could see just on the other side of the ditch, he was laying there expired. Yeah, you so. know, going going through a, a hunt like this uh, for somebody, uh, as you're re-describing, I'm kind of reliving the whole thing, but... Um, you know, there's there's so much difference, I think, personally, and I could be totally wrong, but I've seen people that have went out west and hunted versus here in Michigan. To me, they're two totally separate animals, you know, uh, of way styles of hunting. Do, when, when somebody comes to you and they say, you know, I want to retain your services, you know, for a guide, elk guide, do, do you ever talk about what, to, you know, like maybe if you guys, you know, I've hunted out west, I know what to bring. Do you, do you have that discussion of what to bring um, with you or what to expect being a Michigan I, hunt? I do, actually. And um, I try really hard to make them understand that this is very different. And, you know, it takes a, a few days usually of them hunting to, to grasp that. You know, after a couple of days, they're like, oh, no, she's right. Mm-hmm. This this is a whole different ball game. This is a lot harder, you know. But I've had other clients that were like very adamant that no, just like out west, it should be just like this, and this is how it should go. And <laughs> one way or another, I'm going to get my elk, and and it's like okay, wait. But if you don't listen to me, I'm not going to be able to help you because it's not the same, and you're going to end up having a really hard time or a non-successful hunt. And that's the last thing I want to happen to you. So if you just trust me, we can get there. And that's something that I try, you know, now, especially after some recent, you know, events, I have made it a a big plan of mine and, and, and all the hunts that I've booked since I've expressed that, you know, really do your research into your guide. Okay. Make sure that you trust your guide before you go And make sure you talk to your guide about those kinds of things. If you've only hunted out west and your guide tells you that, you know, okay, this is not like hunting out west, you have to have faith in your guide. Because, you know, they don't want to not be successful either. They want to have it be the most successful hunt they can because it looks bad on them too if it's not successful. I I, I think that's kind of hilarious. You go out and you go get an outfitter and then you take whatever he or she tells you and throw it out the window throw it out the window yeah why did i why why did i get an outfit (laughs) no she knows or he paid that money (laughs) right he knows or she knows what they're talking about that's why you're an outfitter you're licensed you're whole show me (laughs) right well well after after uh you know tagging along that day uh and observing uh you know you give me some really good information uh i just couldn't close the deal on my hunt and we we missed the mark by a couple hundred yards uh, that last day, uh, but everything that you told me, it was like, it was just like clockwork. It's like, yeah, I mean, it was boom, 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 boom. It's like we just well, follow instructions, well, you know, and, and and along the lines of that, you know, instructions and, and trusting your guide. But you also, how you know, you keep track and scout all year long. Mm-hmm. Yes. So, yep. <laughs> okay, right? You you're there. Mm-hmm. However many days you get out in the field, Jennifer. And, and 
and know these animals. Like you said, you knew this pack and what they were going to do, when they were going to leave, how are they going to do it. So, yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna put my uh, my money on you. Well, and, and even my guide who, who was along uh, that day, after we had talked, and when we we talked after that, actually even, um, I believe the morning before we went out to that same area. And after we left, you know, my, my guy, he's like, he said, she knows her stuff. You know, there's no doubt, you know, she's got the information. She knows what's going on. So it's, uh, he says, you need to listen. <laughs> you know, my guy's telling me you need to listen. So. And, yeah. and that, that, that's, just a, that's, I don't know. To me, that's why I got an outfitter. That's why you pay an outfitter. To, to do the homework for me. Because like you said, Jennifer, they might've gone other places, but this is another state and it, Sure, characteristics of the animal are the same, but well, even in the different. area that I was hunting, that was away from where where y'all were at, Jennifer. It, it, it was I don't know thirty, forty miles, maybe. I I, I don't know exactly, but um, it was it was you know we weren't having any success. It, it really we saw some, but we didn't see a lot. And everything I saw was bulls, and I had a cow tag, but you know, um, which you know I, I guess up there in that area, you the outfitters exchange information, which I think is great. Try to help each well, other out. You got to, and that's the only way to do it is, you know, you have to be able to help each other out with everything. So, I mean, because everybody wants each other to be successful. We don't want to hurt each other's hunts, or or you shouldn't want to anyways. The more right. ethical way to be is to help each other out, help everybody be successful. We want the herd to be contained the way it should be so that we can have good numbers for hunting and and it's the best management for them, and there's a reason why they pick the numbers that they do. Princess, enough. Right, yeah, it, she's talking to you, Danny. <laughs> Thanks. I'm sorry, I couldn't you, resist. You knew it, I knew it. It's my squirrel dog. You know, she's it, a little annoying sometimes. It, and everybody at home that's watching right now is laughing. Right, <laughs> You're exactly. going to start calling you Princess. No, I'm not going to be Princess. <laughs> I'm sorry, I lost total track now. <laughs> but um, you're right, Jennifer. They, they, you know, you need to help each other out because you got to help the DNR all together collectively, or else if this goes awry in any way, shape, or form, you guys are all going to be out of a job, and mm-hmm. it's not going to be good. Yeah. That's exactly it. Yep. Well, I, and I go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, I was going to say, and honestly, it's the best for the herd as well. You know what I mean? Everybody, you know, we want to have the elk here. They're a beautiful animal. They're a majestic creature. They're they're not, you know, a, a bad animal. They're not going to harm a lot of stuff. I mean, they may do some crop problems and stuff here and there, but if we manage them properly, then that can be solved. You know what I mean? All of the farms and stuff, if you're having problems with elk, people would love to come there and hunt them if you would give them permission. And if you vet the guides that you allow on your property, you can make sure that your property is going to be treated with the utmost respect. I, I think that, I think that's a, a great, great thing that what you just said, Jennifer, is if the so said farmer would allow the outfitter and talk with the outfitter and gain yeah. their trust and put it and, and put it on you as well that you're going to bring the hunter on to the property, but you're going to treat the property with respect. You have yeah. to, I think so. You know, and that's it, been a, a big thing amongst uh, cooperatives now that, like uh, the, the deer co-ops that we've got in Michigan. I've been to a couple of rendezvous, and that's been the big talk right now. Is how do you how do we get farmers who are having these crop damage problems, whether it be deer or elk, and getting the hunters together? Uh, and, and like you were talking, I, I equate this. To, to the uh, the guides even talking and sharing information is, is kind of like a deer co-op where you you got private landowners, neighbors that are sharing information to better the whole herd. So are the the guides with the elk, but also working with the farmers. I mean, I think that's 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 a huge thing that I think a lot of us really miss, and that's something we need to really work on. I think you know as far as working with our farmers. Yes. So. Um, I tell you what, we're bumping up against uh, another break here. When we come back, I'd like to talk a little bit about the, the, the difference between hunting them in the fall and hunting them in December, if, if we could go that direction a little bit. Yeah. Okay, we're going to step outside. We're going to take our next break. We'll be right back after this. PSE Archery has always dominated the speed category. Now, the most revolutionary cam system ever to hit the market has perfected the shooting experience. Introducing PSE's Evolve Cam System, featuring extremely high let-off capabilities and the smoothest draw cycle in history. No other cam system has ever delivered this level of total comfort and total control. Experience PSE. Experience performance. 
Welcome back. Second or third segment of the show. Third segment of the show. And uh, before we went to break, talked a little bit. We've been talking a lot about elk hunt right now, but I know here in Michigan, there, there's a, two different seasons. There's the September hunt, and then there's the December hunt. Obviously, both are in, you know towards the end of the year, but there's there's a big distinction between these two styles of hunting. Am I right? Yes, there but, is. Um, the early hunt, actually, because it's like an early hunt and a late hunt. It's not necessarily just September because there's three parts to the early hunt. So you get three different um, five-day stretches of hunting in the early hunt um and one of them is usually the end of august and then there's one in the first part of september and one towards the end of september okay now that time of the year i mean obviously there's snow on the ground in december usually what what's the big distinction between the two different times it is hot 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 for the august one and the animals are primarily nocturnal um, okay. you'll see them sometimes in the daytime, but it's usually early, early in the morning or just before dark, um, or, um, up under the pines in the shade where they can get away from all of that heat. And they're trying to avoid the sun as much as possible. They're a really large body animal with a big, thick fur coat. They don't want to be hot and miserable like that. It burns up a lot of energy to do that, you know? So, um, they try to, you know, bed down for those periods of time as much as they can and get up and move in the cooler temperatures in the dark. So, so that definitely makes it a lot more hard. Um, there's a lot of foliage. So seeing them in the woods is a lot harder. Okay. And they can disappear in those saplings and stuff real easy. And that's where you're going to find them a lot of that time of the year because they're munching the tops, getting ready for winter and stuff. So um, they will they go right into them and they disappear and there's no chance of getting a shot. Even if you can see them, you know, you you're, can't shoot into that thick of stuff. It's just too much of a risk. So it makes it a lot harder. Um, the, the, the bugs are tough. That time of year. I, was, I, was, I was just about to say, bring your thermosol. Yeah, right. Yeah, um, I, I carry mine always. I keep one in every blind. I do try to set up blinds to give some kind of a relief from the heat. Um, you know, we will walk around a lot. We, um, I believe I've kind of given you some pictures of some of the spots. Um, I've mm-hmm. had hunters lay down and take naps because the heat's so bad and you just got to wait it out. And uh, usually you're more successful in the September sets. Really? Than anything, but I have had a couple of successful um, hunts since I started in the August period. I try not to book in that first week, though, very much. And I even tell all my hunts, you know, it it's really hot. It's miserable. They're not moving as much unless it really cools down for that week. You know, if you if we know that it's going to be a cool week and it's they forecasted it, then, yeah, come up and we'll try. Because I'm always willing to try. You know what I mean? But knowing that it's that hot out and knowing how hard it is on them, I at least try to give the hunter the privilege of knowing that, you know, your odds are a lot less likely at that time. Um, well, with that heat at that time of year, uh, the other thing I got, I got to really think that is a concern is, is scent control at that point in time, because it is so hot. Um, yeah. you, do, do you use, do you anything for that? Do you use anything to maybe lure elk in at that time of I, year or ma- i do i use buff baits actually firm believer in them absolutely love them <laughs> absolutely <laughs> I, I use buff baits um elk scents i have um their the bull scents and i have cow estrus scents um that i'll use to lure them in i use their cow call okay. actually and i've had good success with that cow call um I actually really enjoy using a lot of their products. They have an acorn scent cover um, or a corn or um, pine. They have many, many of them, actually. Um, But for that particular area that I follow around a lot, I I tend to use the acorn, the pine scent covers a lot to cover up our body odor because you're hot, you're sweating, um, you want to be geared in the right kind of gear so that you're, you know, you're got the right kind of scent wicking layers. So it's keeping your sweat away and blocking your scent in, locking it in as best as possible, but cool at that as well. Um, you know, you're going to want to match the foliage cause you don't really want to be standing out because honestly, out, it's not like hunting out West. It is not, they are a lot more spooky here. And, um, if they see you, they're more likely not to come in 
than if they don't and you can blend in with your surroundings and get that scent covered. So, um, and I try really hard to be a stickler with all of it. I make everybody spray down with my stuff. Um, you know, sure. You probably have your own products that you'd like to use, but I'd rather you use mine because that's what I know I'm successful with. And, um, I would not want to use anything else. So something you just said along the way there, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm just going to go ahead and say it. Um, you said taking that scent and you're locking it in and blocking it. I want to congratulate you on and getting on uh, scent block or scent lock team. Uh, that's something that we're a part of and you're a part of now. So welcome to the team. I just when you said that, I knew where you're going with that, but I just want to throw that out there. <laughs> <laughs> and, and a nice uh, gear bag you've got there behind you as well. I like that. Thanks. It's my favorite. So, 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 so in August you're going to be wearing your, your bathing suit, <laughs> right. and, and, in, and, in, and in December you're going to be wearing. Every clothes possible known to man. Right. It, well, it, it depends. I mean, there are days that it can be not that bad. And then there are days where, I mean, it's freezing sub-zero temperatures. And you, you could have any in between it as Michigan. So, mm-hmm. I mean, I've had to go e- either way. I've had December hunts where there wasn't even snow on the ground. And I've had December hunts where it was well over knee deep. And we had a December hunt this year one day when it was nine below. Yes, and it was very, very cold, and it was a very hard sit. And sitting out in the open on those hunts is very hard. Um, it, you have to be prepared for that. You got to get yourself ready. You need, you know, to be in shape at least some, because hunting for elk, the likeliness of having to hike is pretty high. You just, so, well, you just mentioned something. You got to be in shape. Dan, everybody's going to get tired of me talking about this, but Danny and I, we've, we've been on this kick of getting in shape for these hunts, and really working at it. Do you do anything uh, to stay in shape, or does your daily activities keep you uh, going for the when it comes hunting season? I have a farm. <laughs> <laughs> that's your workout. So, that's my workout. Um, actually, no, I hike a lot. Um, I'm a very energetic person, so I do um, hike as much as I can. You know, I have to stop and take breaks. I have a heart issue, so I do take breaks a lot. So I try to, you know, it, understand a lot of my clients are um, – out of shape like first yeah well they're <laughs> out of they're shape just elderly I, they're old and out of shape <laughs> and that <laughs> but they um they they are they're generally the elderly and um because i cater to a lot of veterans and first responders actually nice. so um and and i think that it's important for them and i let them know ahead of time you know you have to tell me what kind of shape you're in like can you hike or can you not because that will determine on where i'm taking you to hunt Okay. So once again, options as well. That I always follow where the herds um, are going. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, because I want to make sure that you know I have I have places set up that I can take somebody that maybe can only hike in a hundred yards or two hundred yards, and that's as far as they're going to get. Right. You know what I mean. And or I have a place where I can take somebody that is you know in really good shape. They're fit. They they you know but walk all the time. They've been out there hiking anyways, and they're good to go and they can handle it. And I still. Because no matter how much hiking you do on a treadmill or in the gym or, you know, those types of places, it's not the same as hiking outside. In snow? Yes. And when you're hiking outside in the snow, it's a lot different. It tolls your body a lot harder. Carrying gear? Yep. And you usually, you know, that pack, it might feel like it's not that much when you started out with all your snacks and your water bottles and your stuff that you think you need. But really bring the bare minimum do you, you go know, through somebody's pack and say nope you don't need that get rid of that get rid of this get rid of that do you ever no nope. i i allow them to do what they think and then if they start having a problem i carry it for them so no excuses no excuses yep. no excuses no nope, you're just going we're going <laughs> well like you said you've got a job to do and you're gonna you're gonna do your job to make them successful yeah, and, and something that I've tried really hard to fix about myself is I have a habit of, because I'm so used to being in the woods by myself, I'll just trudge along. And I tend to not forget that they're with me, but I forget that they might be not able to keep up. So I have to slow myself down and pace myself at their pace. So I'll try to kind of feel out how they're walking and you know what pace can they handle, and then... It, pursue that so that I can keep them with me because the most important thing is when you're rocking around looking for the elk is you could walk up on them 
just about anywhere if you're in their territory. Well, that's it, right? If you're out there and you know they're in the area, at any behind any tree is possible that it they can do that. Happened to me, I think, the second day out. Well, this, so the second day is when we when we we crossed, we cut their track, and wasn't we, that with the guy that we crossed paths with? Yeah, and we they we, jumped up behind us. Yeah, and so you know that's how that's how it goes. So you know. Um, you got to be prepared at any time. Well, I'll tell you what. Um, I want to save what little bit of time we got left for the next segment. I, I want to get into the predator hunting because you've been doing quite a bit of that here lately, right? Yeah. Yep. I love predator hunting. It's one of my favorite things to do. Um, I coyote hunt year round and I book hunts for that year round with people. And I have clients that come back every single year to do it. Um, and we just have a great time. Uh, I use calls or we use dogs. Um, All right. We'll do both. So let's, and, let's, let's um, get to our break and we'll come back. And I got one more question for you from our audience, so how about we take a break? Okay, all right, let's step outside, take our next break. We'll be right back after this. Acceleration is part of PSE's DNA. PSE pioneered the speed movement. Now they've developed the vapor category to help you find the most powerful bows on the market to fit you. High speed equates to intense power and building the momentum you need to be successful. Are you a vapor shooter? Find out at pscarchery.com. Welcome back. Last segment of the show, we're talking with Jennifer Drake of Drake's Guiding Services in northern Michigan, northern Lower Peninsula. But before we get to this, we've got a poll. People, People are chiming in on. The poll today was... Do you predator hunt or trap to preserve other species? 63% of the people say yes, they do. That's awesome. I, I, that is really cool. I, I didn't think it'd be that high. 13% said they'd never have, and 25% say no, but they'd like to try sometime. Right, exactly. And I know a person that could get them involved in that it, if they Exactly, want to. if they want to do predator hunting. But, but one of the questions I have for you is, do you guide for bear as well? Yes. Yep, I do. I guide for bear. Um, and... It, we can do it with dogs or we do it over bait. So um, I, the, I, my uncle actually does the dogs, and um, they have a really good success rate, and he loves to run them. So anytime I have a client, if they want that experience and they just want to hear the hounds barooing in the woods and, and get to have that, because it is a wonderful, fun experience too. I mean, there's nothing like hearing those dogs running in the woods and knowing what they're running and that, you know, and, and following them through the woods and getting there and finding it in the tree or, you know, sometimes they get in holes in the ground. It kind of depends or they'll get up underneath of a mess of trees and it's just, it's a lot of fun. So if a client wants that kind of experience, we take them right out and get them right on that kind of stuff. And, and usually they have so much fun. I mean, you can't go wrong with such a great group of guys. They, they all are wonderful people and they're all good hearted natured boys. So it's good fun time. Well, we're talking about running dogs. Uh, I've got a video here that you sent to us of running dogs on cats on, on Bobcat. Uh, yep. Talk a little bit about the, the, the predator hunting. I mean, we've, we transitioned, you know, out of fall hunting season, out of the late hunting season, you know, for deer and elk. And, and now we're, we're into, the, if you're not an ice fisherman, well, even if you are an ice fisherman, you're not doing it downstate, but if you, if you're not doing it upstate, this is another great way to get out. Yes. Yep. It's a lot of fun. Um, So coyote hunting, you can do it, you know, pretty much any time of the day, but the best times are either early morning, um, just before dark or in the middle of the night, um, running calls. So, you know, running with dogs, you can run them anytime during the day, but if you're running calls doing it, I have so much fun doing it at night, you know, I'll try to time it perfect so that it's, you know, a nice full moon night if I don't have the night scope. Um, when I get to use the night scope, I, you know, I don't have to worry about the moonlight so much, but we have a blast. We run the calls and, um, try to call them in to, you know, whatever area we know that there's a lot of them in so we can help the deer population and the elk maybe in that area. And, you know, some of the small game, cause you know, I mean, our snowshoes are just coming back and doing really good. So we want to get as many of them predators out of those areas as possible. Yeah, run, what do you have a bigger problem with, with cats or dogs in that area for predators? Um, we have more coyotes up here um, than cats, but but we do have plenty of cats up here too. So, I mean, there's no shortage of the cats at all. 
Um, they're a lot of fun. They don't get real big down here, um, but you can get them at a decent size sometimes. I mean, I've pulled out a nice one um, last year. It's done getting mounted now. and um, But usually the bigger ones are up in the UP. Okay, so, so. why why is that compared to up, up there versus down here? Why are they bigger up there? Just more to eat? I think it's um, not necessarily more to eat um, as they they need to be bigger up there. Survival? You know, survival, yeah. Gotcha. So, yeah. you know, there's more snow. It's harder to rain. It's, you know what I mean? So they need to be bigger to be able to get around up there, and they don't need to be as big down here. Yeah, I got a picture up of the one that you, you the big one you just take. Uh, took here recently you said that thing was 35 something 35.8 pounds 35.8 pounds yep that is just incredible it's a big kitty it's yeah. well well look, here, here's a picture right here your son's with you that cat stretched out i mean yeah, obviously you're holding it up a little bit over your head but that thing is almost as tall as you are yeah yep it was pretty close it was um from the tip of the toes to the tip of the paws where it was hanging um if you would have put it like right next to me it was like six inches shy of being just as tall as I am, but I'm pretty short, so, you know, five foot two. That's a big cat. <laughs> wow. It is a big cat. That is incredible. Um, do, do you do a lot, of, a lot of guiding for this? I mean, is this something that's becoming more popular or, or, or no? It has in the last couple of years. It's gotten a lot more popular. Um, I do a lot of guiding for the coyote hunting more so than the cat hunting, um, but it, I've definitely had a lot more inquiries about the cat hunting this, in the last couple of years, and it's my favorite. It so is, okay. It, it's a lot more of a challenge. How so? I mean, what, what's the biggest challenge in it? They are a lot more leery and sneaky than like coyotes or anything else that you're hunting out there. Um, they will sneak in and you won't even see them sometimes. They're so crafty at coming in and getting downwind of you and, and, and finding you long before you'll ever see them. They, they have great vision. They're great noses, great ears. You know, I mean, they're on top predator for sure. So, um, it just makes it a lot harder, definitely. So so you see it as more of a challenge is what it is. Yep. Well, now, you, you take somebody out on this. Can you take groups of people out on, on a cat hunt? I mean, wh what would you what would be you be comfortable with? Like, let's say, Danny and I or maybe three people? For, wh where is that comfort zone for people maybe wanting to do a group-style hunt for cats yep. or for, for coyotes? So if we're just running calls, um, I prefer to do it, you know, just me and one other person, um, maybe two max, um, just for the simple fact that it's a lot harder to block everybody's scent down and, okay. um, and okay. keep everybody still enough. Makes sense. Yeah, it does. Makes complete sense. Yeah, what? because a lot of the times when you're cat hunting, you're not sitting in a blind. I mean, you know, occasionally if you've got a, an area where, you know, you can leave a blind year round and it never moves and they'll eventually get used to it, then yes, you have a situation where you can sit in a blind. Um, that usually happens only on private land hunts. Um, it, but for state land, putting in a pop-up blind, that cat isn't going to come there. Now, for people who are interested in, in hunting Michigan for, for Bobcat, it, it, correct me if I'm wrong in this, but you have to put in, is it for trapping or for hunting? Hunting, you got to put in for that, that tag, that fur tag. By yep, you have to get a fur bearer's license, and right. then you have to um, request the Bobcat tag. And there's no charge for the Bobcat tag. It's just the charge for the fur bearer's license. Um, and then you can get two tags, actually. You can get um, a tag for, that's for any unit, and then a tag for unit A up in the UP. So if you're going to do this, you need to make sure you, it's not like you can say, okay, I'm, I'm going to requ uh, request that, you know, you take me out for a cat hunt, a bobcat hunt, and then I'm going to buy my license when I get there. The, it, by the time you do this in, later in the season, it's too late because you can't get that yeah. kill tag. So you have to pre-plan yeah. this. Yep, yeah, you have to get it done ahead of time because there's a cutoff date for when you can actually even get your tags. So okay, so that's that, that's mm -hmm. good to know. And and Josh Hagerman is chiming in and he says he wants to go cat hunting. <laughs> I I figured I seen him chime in there. I thought he, he'd be a guy that would uh, would love it. Um, you know, I, I've done some coyote hunting up at our place. Um, if okay, let me run this by. If, if somebody were to come up and want to do a cat hunt, and they got their tag, and you're out. Is there just as much opportunity to shoot a coyote the way you're hunting, or is that hunt a totally different style of hunting? If you're um, if you're calling, 
it, there's just as much opportunity to shoot a coyote. Um, actually, my last hunter I just had um, in, we um, didn't actually get to shoot a cat because we never saw one, but we did have coyotes come in. Okay. So we and we were able to get two coyotes and actually a coon. <laughs> and actually, so. that's the same license, right? Yes. So there yep. you go. Buy one yeah. license and you got multiple opportunities to take different critters, fur bearing critters. Right, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. that is awesome. Uh, you know, we're, we're bumping up here. We've got a few minutes left. Okay, so one question uh, that was asked is uh, out of your elk hunters, uh, have you had anybody bow hunt for elk? I've had them try. Um, no, I haven't had anybody actually take one with a bow yet. Um, but I did have a fella that that was what his goal was. Um, but it was the early hunt, and it's so hard, and they're just really nocturnal at that time that he ended up giving up and took her. And I, I think I actually sent you a picture of him with his cow. Um, he took her with his rifle. So oh, okay. So so he tried. Wasn't successful, yeah. so he went to his backup of using a rifle. She wouldn't come close enough, so he ended up just picking up his rifle and doing it with the rifle instead. Because my biggest thing I tell my hunters is, if you want to try with a bow, that's fine, but bring a rifle. Yeah, to me, it's it, like once again, Michigan versus out west. You know, we see all these videos and people that go out west, and they do take them with bows, but. Yep. I just I just don't think it's ap- comparing apples to apples. I think it's 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 way different. It's a completely different set of hunting. It's and you know, I've heard this before and and I'm not like claiming this ability myself, but I've heard that if you can successfully hunt in northern Michigan and take out a nice buck every year, then you can hunt anywhere else in the United States, but it does not work the same in reverse. So, I feel like if that's true, you know, um, a lot of these people that go out west and they think, nah, nah I'm not going to bother hunting here in Michigan for this kind of stuff. It'll be easier out west. You know, it, they're shortchanging themselves because they have the chance for a wonderful challenge here in Michigan. Um, we have great hunting here. I mean, maybe we don't have some of the biggest, giantest bucks, but that could come in time. It, it is could. a possibility. You see trophy bucks taken from Michigan on a regular. It, it and even up here, it happens, you know, not every day, you know, definitely, but you definitely get these big, beautiful bucks that'll come. There was a, a young lady last year, I believe it was, that she took a 14 buck, fourteen point buck here in Sheboygan County. You know, it's, I've, I've heard, heard people talk about what you're just, just saying there. And Danny and I both said the same thing. You know, you want to shoot a big buck, you know, come to Michigan, hunt public land, and show me you can do it here. And if you can, you can do it anywhere. Because the hunting pressure here is tremendous. The hunting, mm-hmm. the hunting rules here are different. We don't, we don't have APRs. Uh, we don't, you know, people well, put them on themselves, except for the Northwest 13. But it's, it's just a whole different way of hunting. Yeah, it's a completely different ball game. So, well, I tell you what, it's uh, we're bumping up here close to the end. I, I want for everybody to be able to, uh, if they want to reach out to you and inquire about a hunt, I've, I've got. Uh, your information here. I'm just trying to find it here real quick. Um, let people know where they can find you at. Well, I have um, my Facebook page is Drake's Guiding Service. And go ahead and give that a like anytime you want. And um, I post on there. It's not all the time, but I post fr- hunts on there frequently. And if you ever have any questions, you can shoot me a message right through there. Or um, I do have a web page, and that's also Drake's Guiding Services, LLC. And um, I'm also on Instagram, and uh, that's Jennifer Drake on Instagram. And I don't know, uh, just and if I, not, they can get a hold of us, and we'll get a hold of you. Absolutely, right? I'm on the I'm on the DNR's guide list. Um, so there's you know that you can find my name and number on there. I have a business card. Um, if you guys have that information, you can pop that up, and. Um, that has, you know, my phone number and everything in that. So, and yeah, just reach out to me, send me a message and let me know. I'm usually pretty good about getting back to you as quickly as I can. And, you know, I'll let you know whatever days I have available and we can work with you, you know, and something I try to do is I stick with my hunters until we're successful. It's important to me. So say I have an elk hunt. I don't only just stick with you for like three days. If you're the early season hunt and you're there, um, we hunt all three parts. I stay with you until the end if we are successful or not. 
There you go. So I, I'm not going to leave you hanging or make you have to go find somebody else. I will work my butt off to get you that animal. Yeah, you know, Michigan's first female hunting guide. You know, uh, congrats on that alone. I mean, that speaks volumes to me. Uh, it's just something yep. you don't see here in Michigan. You know, I mean, we're we're encouraging uh, women to get into the outdoors, but you're not only in it, man, you're, you're living it. You're working it. It's just, to me, it's amazing. I love it. And I think so many more women should get out there and do this. They, you know, women have a tendency to be a little bit more observant. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'll give you that. I'll give you that. Yes. <laughs> so if they go out there and, you know, they could be really successful and have a lot of fun and it's so good for the heart and soul to be in the woods. So Absolutely. Definitely well, recommend it. Well, speaking of, uh, of females getting into the outdoors, uh, your daughter, you, you told me before the show, is going to try to take up bow hunting this year? Yes, she's very excited about it. Um, so we got her first bow. She got her a nice youth bow and um, going to try it out and see what happens. Uh, she was bound to determine that her next deer has to be by bow. There you go. She doesn't want to do it with a crossbow, and she's already taken a nice five point with her rifle. So, we're I got gonna a try feeling to make she it knows happen. somebody that'll get her out and get her on a nice boat. I, think so. I just, I just got this sneaking suspicion. I, I, I think yeah. we know somebody. But I, <laughs> but I also can see in the blind me, mom, mom, I got this, mom. Does that happen <laughs> in the blind? Is there, is there that that mother daughter friction at times in the blind? Um, no, actually, my kids are really great in the blind. They um, have been sitting with me for years since they were little. I've been taking them out um, as soon as they were capable of sitting still. So I get them out in the blind. They sit down. They hunker down and are nice and quiet. They love watching the animals. And I'm usually in an area if I'm taking them with me um, so that they can see a lot of nature. So there's a lot for them to see. That's awesome. Kids, I think that's what they're missing today. There's so many kids that they're they're stuck on their phones all the time or their iPad or their computer. I mean, and we love technology. I mean, we, we're using it we're to using actually broadcast today. today, you know. But the point is, you need that separation, that time, and to get in the outdoors. I mean, and hats off to you for taking the kids out and, you know, and, and working the way you do in the outdoors. It's just, it's incredible to have good people like yourself sharing it with other people and that's the one thing i I, i've noticed is that you share it with everybody i try real hard and i love taking kids out to it that is one of my favorites it they're so fun because they get so excited and they're so thrilled with the moment and even like teenage kids you know i took a a young fellow kind of under my wing a little bit and he's a good kid and he ended up going off to the military but we got him his first buck up here and he had so much fun hunting and doing all of that, and and he just really had a great time. So, and and to me, that is the best part is giving him that that experience in um, a really good morally ethical hunt and trying to teach him the conservation side of it and and how to um, hunt successfully and and carefully so that you you know your shot placement so the animals aren't suffering and so to make it a good experience for them so setting them up for the best chance of that is the most important for me because i don't want them to be deterred from ever hunting again that's right well i'm gonna throw one more question at you here we got time for it okay so you you hunt all this game you're able to to spend all this time in the outdoors actually i'm gonna ask you a couple questions (laughs) what is your favorite wild game meal to prepare and what is it or how do you prepare it okay well my absolute favorite is of course venison and we eat it darn near daily in my house Mm. okay (laughs) and um and back straps actually is the the favorite and my favorite way to cook it is uh, i love cooking so um I'm kind of a bit of a good chef (laughs) (laughs) um i will take a whole tenderloin or a back strap, and I will wrap it in a maple smoked bacon. And I take that and I glaze that with a homemade maple syrup. Wow. Homemade and maple syrup. Yeah. Because <laughs> Michigan's great for its maple syrup, you know. Right on. So, <laughs> and I'll take that and um, I drizzle the maple syrup over it. And I sear it in a pan so it kind of caramelizes that flavor into it and kind of crispies up the bacon a little bit. Okay. And then I will bake that in the oven or throw it out on the grill. If I can get it out on the grill, I much prefer it out on the grill that way. And then just nice low temperatures, slow cook it like that until it's done. And then um, 
after that, I'd like to, you know, season up some taters with it and, you know, whatever side for it. The kids usually let me know what which one they want. So Okay, but. so it's on the grill. Charcoal yeah. or gas? Charcoal. No gas for I, me. I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now that, now that Danny and I are over here salivating because Truly. we're so hungry now, uh, last question we'll let you go is, you're okay, you're taking out whoever. You're taking Danny and I out on, on uh, a predator hunt, and we're, we're cutting across country. We're in the Pigeon River area. We're, we're hiking. We're, we're cutting a trail. Yep. What snack do you have in your backpack? What snack do I keep in my backpack? Yeah, for you. Me, me actually, I don't snack. Um, Interesting. I don't. I try not to, um, because as a girl, it's a lot harder to go to the bathroom in the woods than it is for a boy. Gotcha. Fair enough. Fair enough. So I try to keep that as light as possible, but um, actually, usually when I'm wandering around in the woods, I forage from the woods. If it's in the summertime, early hunts, I eat apples off the trees, berries, leeks, you know, different things. I'll snack while I'm in the woods and munch on that stuff. Um, I generally... Once in a blue moon, I'll carry some kind of jerky with okay. me. Okay, okay, interesting. Um, just for a little Pretty extra cool. protein or whatever. So blueberries but, up there are awesome in the summer. Yeah, and raspberries and blackberries. There's always some kind of fruit to eat up here in the early hunts, and then the you know, you got lots of stuff to munch on. So very cool. Well, I tell you what, uh, we're going to let you go here. We're going to wrap up the show. Um, but hang on with us here. Once we get done, we'll talk to you briefly. But uh, for everybody that's on the podcast. Uh, you know, come back over to the live stream and check it out later this week. You know, we're on YouTube as well. And if uh, if you would, you know, share it uh, across your social media. You know, it helps us and, and, and in turn it helps the people who help us. And uh, if you like the show, you know, share it with. And I tell you what, if you're looking for a hunt, doesn't matter what kind of hunt. Obviously, she guides for everything. Get a hold of Jennifer. We'll have her information. If uh, if you can't find it, get a hold of us and we'll get it to you. So that'll do it for us on the podcast, folks, this week. We'll see you again next week. And don't forget, you can catch us in syndication at 2 p.m. Eastern time on goodtalkradio.com. This episode was brought to you by PSE Archery, Spot Shooters Archery, Easy Cut, Packer Max, Hunter's Blend Coffee, Scent Lock, Scent Blocker, Limb Walker Game Calls, Buck Baits, Gut Check, Stanislavski Release Aids, Copper John, Fourth Arrow Camera Arms, Wind Sense Vapor Hunting Products, and Rebel 6 Rubs. Thanks for listening and join us again here next week. Until then, remember, as we always like to say, if you're out on the water or in the woods, shoot straight and be safe until next week on the Up North Journal.